Hello and welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of KubeCon CloudNativeCon 2021. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE with David Nicholson, our cloud host analyst, and it's exciting to be back in person uh, in events. So we're back, it's been two years with KubeCon and Linux Foundation, so it's great to be a hybrid event. And we have a great guest here, CUBE alum and Nick Durkin, CT, field CTO of Harness and Harness.io is the URL, love the .io. Great to see you. Thank you guys for having me on, genuinely appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. You were a part of our AWS Startup Showcase, which you guys were featured um, as a fast growing, mature company. Um, as cloud scales, you guys have been doing extremely well, so congratulations. But now we're in reality now, right? So, okay, cloud native has kind of like, okay, we don't have to sell it anymore, people buying into it, um, and now operationalizing it with cloud operations, which means you're running stuff, applications and infrastructure as code, and it costs money. Yeah, Martin Casada at Andreessen Horowitz, oh, repatriate from the cloud. So there's a lot of, there's some cost conversations starting to happen. This is what you guys are in the middle of. Yeah, absolutely. What's interesting is when you think about it today, when we want to shift left, when you want to empower all the engineers, when you want to empower people, we're not giving them the data they need, right? They get a call from the CFO 30 days later, as opposed to actually being able to look at what change I did and how it actually affected. And this is what we're bringing and allowing people to have is now really empowering. So throughout the whole software delivery life cycle from CI, continuous integration, continuous delivery, feature flagging, and now even bringing cost modeling and, and cloud cost management, and even then being able to shut down, shut down the services that you're not using. How much of that is waste? We talk about it every single cloud conference, it's how much is waste. And so being able to actually turn those on, use those accordingly, and then take advantage of even the cheapest instances when you should, that's really what we're trying to provide. It's so funny, people almost trip over dollars to pick up pennies in the cloud business because they're so focused on innovation that they think, okay, we got to just innovate at all costs. But at some point, you can make it productive for the developers in process, in the pipeline to actually manage this. That's exactly it. I mean, if you think about it, to me, in order to reach, say, continuous delivery, we have to automate everything. Right? But that doesn't mean stop at just delivering you know, to production. That, that means to customer, which means we've got to make them happy. But then ultimately, all of those resources in dev, in QA, in staging, in UAT, we have to take care of those as well. And if we're not being mindful of it, the costs are astronomical. Right? And we've seen it time and time again uh, with every company. You've seen, you've seen every article about how they've blown through all their budgets. So bringing it to the people that can affect change, that's really the difference making it visible, looking at it in depth, not just at the cloud level and all the spend there, but also even at the, uh, think about it, the Kubernetes level, down to the containers, the pods, and understanding where are the resources even inside of the clusters. And bringing that as an aggregate, not just for visibility and, and giving recommendations, but now more importantly, because it's part of a pipeline, start taking action. That's where it's interesting. It's not just about being able to see it and understand it and hope Right, hope's not a strategy. Acting upon it is what makes it valuable, and that's part of the automate everything piece. Yeah, well, at the, at the dawn of the age of DevOps, uh, there was a huge incentive for a developer just to get their job done, to seize control of infrastructure. The yep. idea of infrastructure as code, you know, in its, in its you know, when, when it was being born, it's fantastic. I've always wondered, though, you know, be careful what you wish for. Do you really want all of that responsibility? So we've got responsibility from a compliance and security perspective, and of course, cost. So, so where, do we, where do we go from here, I guess is the question. Yeah, so when we look at building this all together, I think when we think about software delivery, everybody wants to go fast. We start with velocity, right? And everybody says, that's where I want to go. And to your point with governance, compliance, the next roadblock to hit is, wait, in order to go fast, I have to do it appropriately. I've got governing bodies that tell me how this has to work, and that becomes a challenge. It slows it down too. It does. I mean, basically people are getting pissed off. This, is, this general sentiment is, is that developers are moving fast with their code and then they have to stop. Compliance has to give the green light, sometimes days. Correct. Uh, used to be weeks, now it's days. It's still unacceptable. So there's, like, there's always been that tension between the security groups or say IT or finance. It's like, slow down. And they actually want to go faster. So that has to be policy based something. Yep. This and is the future. What is your take on that? My take on this is pretty simple. When everybody talks about people, process, and technology, it's kind of bogus, right? It's all about confidence. If you're confident that your developers can deploy appropriately and, and they're not going to do something wrong, you'll let them deploy all the time. Well, that requires process, but if you have tooling that literally guarantees your governance, make sure that at no point in time can any of your developers actually do something wrong, now you have something. That's the key. That's the key. That's the key, because you're giving them a policy-based guardrails Correct. to execute in their programming moment. And that's it. So now you can 
free up all those pieces. So all those bottlenecks, all those waiting, all those time, and this is how all of our customers, they move from, you know, change advisory boards that approve deployments to right, change. Give, give us some, <laughs> give us some, give us some uh, uh, customer anecdotal examples of this in action yeah. and kind of the love letters you get or, or yeah, the, the delighted kudos. customer. What, sure. well, yeah, take us through a use case of how it all plays out. So th this is one of my favorites. So NCR, uh, National Cash Register, if you slide a credit card at like a Chick-fil-A or a Safeway, right? Um, traditional technology, but what was interesting is they went from doing PCI audits, which would take I don't know, seven days to go to a PCI audit, right now with Harness, because every And by the way, when you in the seventh, sixth day, the things that you did on day one changed. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And so now, because they're using Harness and everything's audited, and all the changes are, are, are controlled to make sure that developers, again, can yeah. only do what they're allowed. They only get to progress to production if they've met all their security requirements, all their compliance requirements, all their quality checks. Now, because of that, they literally gave a read-only view of Harness to their auditor, and in three hours, it was over. And it's because now we're that evidence file from code commit through to production, yeah, yeah. it's there for Point them. of sale compliance. Right. So Point what's the benefits compliance. to them? What, what's the result? Saves them time, saves them money, what's the, they sure. get to free up more time? So obviously they chops it down, that's key. Right? Yeah. It's actually something we didn't build in like our ROI calculators, which was we talked to their engineers, and we gave them their nights and their weekends back, which I thought was amazing. The Thursday night when we're doing that deploy, they don't have to be up. Harness is actually managing and understanding, using yeah. machine learning to understand what normal looks like so they don't have to. They don't have to sit and look at the knock or sit in the war room and eat the free pizza, yeah. right? And then when those things break, same concept, right? So, Harness gets So I got to ask you while I got you here, you know, as the software development delivery life cycle is radically being overhauled right now, which people generally agree that that's the case, the yep. old models are, are different. How do you see your vision around AI and automation playing into this? Because you could say, okay, we're going to have different kinds of coding styles. This badge has got an AI block here. It's very Lego block-like. Yep. Okay, services and higher level services in the cloud. What's your reaction to how this impacts automation and AI? Sure, so throughout our entire platform, we've designed our AI to take care of the worst parts of anyone's job. Ask any DevOps person if they love babysitting deployments. They don't. Harness handles that for them. Ask your engineers if they love sitting there waiting for their tests to run. Every time they build, they go get coffee, right? Because we're waiting for all of our tests to run. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Right, the reality and is- And sometimes they have to wait days. And, and that's it, but like if I changed a gas cap yeah. on, uh, on yeah. your car, would you expect me to check every light switch and every electronic piece? No, but why do we do that with code? And so our AI, our ML, is designed to remove all the things that people hate. It's not to remove people's jobs, it's actually to make their jobs much better. How do you guys feed the data? What's the training algorithm for that? How does that work? Yeah, actually it's interesting. A lot of people think about it, it's going to take a ton of time to figure this out. Mm -hmm. um, the good news is we start seeing this on the second deployment, on the second build. We have to have a baseline of what good looks like sure. and that's where it starts mm -hmm. and it goes from there. And by the way, this isn't, a lot of people say AI and they say ML. I teach a class on this because ML is not standard deviation. It's yeah. not some checks. <laughs> so we use a massive amount of machine learning, but we have neural networks to think about things yeah. like engineers do. Like, if we looked at a log and I saw the same log with two different user IDs, you and I would know, well, it's the same thing, it's just different users. But machine learning models don't. So we've got to build neural networks yep. to actually think like humans so that we can provide So that's the whole you. expectation maximization kind of concept Absolutely. that people talk about? Well, and that's it, because at the end of the day, we're, like I said, I'm not trying to take people's jobs. I want to yeah, make their wanted, jobs easier. Yeah, you want to do the crap work out of the way. And I had to do other redundant heavy lifting that they have to do every single time. We That's built, the cloud way. We built mechanical muscle in, in the early 1900s, right? And it made yeah. everyone's jobs easier, allowed them to do more with their time. That's exactly what we're doing here. I mean, we've seen I mean, the big old guys in the industry trying to evolve. You got the hot startups coming out, so you got you know, adapt or die is a classic thing we've been saying for many years, David, on theCUBE, you know that. Yeah. So it's like, this is a moment of truth. We're going to see who comes out the other side. How do you, Nick, what, what would you be your, your kind of guess of when that other side is? When are we going to know the winners and the losers, truly in the sense of where we are now? So I think what I've found is that in this space specifically, there's a constant shift, and this is something with software. Yeah. And, and the problem is, is that we see them come in ebb and flows. Right? And very few times are there, there, there are businesses that actually carry the model. And what you find is that when they focus on one specific problem, it solves it now. If I was working on VMs a few years ago, great. But yeah. now we're, we're here at KubeCon, yeah. right? And that's because it's eaten, eaten uh, that side of the world. And so I think it's the companies that can actually grow with the test of time and continue to expand to where the problems are. 
Right? And that's one of the things that I, I traditionally think about Harness when we've done it. We cover our customers where they were, like the old mainframes if you had to, where they were, yeah. uh, where they are at their traditional, their VMs, I mean, and think, where they're going. I mean, if you think about it, Nick, it's one of these things where it's like, that's such a common sense way to look at it, evolved to where the problems are, ride the right tech ways. But if you think about the high order bit here, it's just applications. I mean, at the end of the day, companies have applications that they want to write. <laughs> Modern, the applications of their business is going to be codified. So that if you just work backwards from there, then you say, okay, what is the infrastructure as code working for me? That's an ethos of DevOps, that's and it. that's where we're at. So I mean, that's why I think the cloud native is kind of won already, but we still have the edge um, devices, more complexity. This is a huge next level conversation. At one point, is we just put a hardened top on the complexity. When is that coming? Because the developers are clear, they want to go fast, they want to go uh, shift left and have all that data, get the right analytics, the telemetry and the AI, but like, it's too complicated still. This it is, is a big problem. It's too complicated. You're asking for a full stack developer to also know infrastructure, to also know edge computing. Like, it's impossible, yeah. right? And this is where tooling helps, yeah. right? Because if you can actually parameterize that and make it so the engineer doesn't have to care, they can do what they're best at. Hey, I'm great at turning code into artifact. Let them do that and have tooling take care of the rest. This is where our goal is. Again, yeah. allow people to do what they love. And this is right. kind of the new roles that are changing. Look at what SRE has done. Yeah. Everyone talks about the SRE, and, and some say it's just as a DevOps guy, but it's not just that. There's also uh, different roles emerging. It's, a, it's an architectural game at this point, you would say, would you say? I'd say 100%, and this is where the decisions that you make on arch architecturally, if you don't know how to then roll them out. This is what we've seen time and time again. You go to these large companies, I've got these great architectures on plan and four years later we haven't reached it. Because to that point, they they've gone the process. the process killed them. Four different new tools throughout the process yeah. as well. Yeah. Well, so, so when do we hit peak Kubernetes? <laughs> peak Kubernetes. <laughs> yeah. um, I think we have a bit to go, in, and I'm excited about the networking space and really what yeah. we're doing there and, and bringing that holistic portion of the network. Like when Istio was originally released, I thought that was one of the most amazing things uh, to truly come to it, and I think there's a vast space in networking. Um, and, I, and so I think in the next few years, we're going to see this you know, turn into that 100% utilized across the board. This will be that where everyone's workloads continue to exist, um, somewhat like where VMs were in the past. And, and, and no, no fear of developers as code in the very near future. You're talking about automating the mundane. Correct. Uh, there have been stories recently about the three-day work week. Yep. You know, as a, as a fan of um, utopian science fiction myself, as opposed to dystopian. Absolutely. Um, I, I think that you know, technology does have the opportunity to lift all boats, and, uh, and it's, it's not, nothing to be afraid of. Yeah. You know, the fact that I put my dishes in the dishwasher and they run by themselves for three hours is a good thing. It's a great thing. I don't need to deal with that. Yeah. Agreed. No, I think that's, and that's what I said in the beginning, right? That's really where we can start empowering people. So allow them to do what they're good at, and yeah. do what they're best at. And if you look at why do people quit, DevOps people are so hard to find. Yeah. Why? Because they're sick and tired of babysitting deployments. And they're told everywhere they go they're not going to have to. Right? <laughs> that's the line. And that's the line. All right, we got a break, but it's great insight to have you on theCUBE. One final question for you. Um, I got to ask about the whole data as code, yep. something that I've been riffing on for a bunch of years now. And as infrastructure as code, we get that, but data is now the resource everyone needs. And everyone's trying, oh, I got a control plane for this and that. But ultimately, data cannot be siloed. This is a critical architectural element. How does that get resolved in the land of competitive advantage and lock-in and whatnot? What's your take on that? So data is an interesting one because it has, right, it has gravity. And this is the problem, and as we move, as I think you guys know, as we move to the edge, as we move, move at places, there's insights to be taken at the edge. There's insights to be taken as it moves through. And I think what you'll see, honestly, going forward, is you'll see compute done differently. To your point, it needs to be aggregated. It needs to be able to be used together, but I think you'll see people computing it on its way through it. So now, even in transport, you'll start seeing insights gained in real time before you can have the larger insights. And I see that happening more and more. Um, and I think ultimately, we just want to empower that. Nick, great to have you on, CTO, uh, field CTO of Harness. And harness.io is the URL. Check it out, thanks for the insight. Thank you so much. Great commentary. Genuinely appreciate it. The natural cube analyst right here, Nick. Of course, we got our, our analyst right here, David Working Nicholson. Me out of a job. <laughs> no, you're good on your own. I'm John Furrier, you know me, I'm the host. Thanks for watching. Stay with two more days of coverage. We'll be back after this short break.